Hey guys, welcome back to this Bible study, this podcast series. Um, I've really enjoyed digging into scripture. I've got I've got just so much scripture written in these notes. Looking into the Old Testament, finding Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Specifically, I challenged you with this a couple of days ago, specifically finding third day resurrection stories in the Old Testament. And, and I'm going to lay one of those out for you today, and I'm just giving you a heads up. If, if the Holy Spirit will help me, this is pretty powerful stuff. I just finished these notes for this Bible study this morning. <clears throat> and so uh, it's not uh, extremely organized in my mind yet, but, but it's fresh. So hopefully that will translate into something that you can pick up with me uh, uh, and, and grab a hold of this and, and, and it stick with you. Hope you have your Bibles. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, last time, yesterday, we stayed in the same chapter the whole time in Genesis 22, looking at Isaac and Jesus. Today, I'm going to cover some 13 chapters and no, it's not going to take any longer than yesterday's did because I'm going to just hit the high points through these chapters. But we're going to look at Joseph and Jesus, Joseph in the Old Testament. So really going to cover Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis chapter 50, which is the account of Joseph and his life. And what a remarkable life it is, so full of foreshadowing of Jesus, so many uh, symbols that we see of the person of Christ, and yes, not just one, but two resurrection accounts within this story. So uh, I would encourage you, write down the scriptures as I give them to you so that you can go back and look at this for yourself, but I'm going to walk you through the life of Joseph and show you in scripture how Jesus shows up in this over and over again, and then we'll conclude with a powerful third day resurrection account uh, in the life of Joseph and Jesus. Heavenly Father, God, we just ask that you would bless this time. Send the one that makes teaching easy. Let your Holy Spirit guide this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's start right here. Joseph was Jacob's youngest son, at least when he was born. He was the youngest at that time. Had 11 older brothers. And the Bible makes it very clear that Jacob loved Joseph the best. Genesis 37 verse 3 says this, now Israel, which is also Jacob, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. So Jacob is older in life when Joseph is born, so he's at a place where he can appreciate um, raising his son uh, in ways that he couldn't when he was a younger father. And, and he's just Joseph is just set apart in the eyes of Jacob. He, he loves Joseph in a very unique and special way. And we see that that's true for Jesus Christ and the love that the Heavenly Father has for His only begotten Son, John 3, 16. The Bible says over and over in the Gospels, Jesus would say that I love the Father and He loves me. And, and one time we hear the voice of God boom out so that people hear Him say, this is my Son of whom I am well pleased. So Jacob had a unique and special love for Joseph, just like our Heavenly Father has a unique and special love for Jesus Christ. And that's where the parallels begin, right there at the beginning of the account of Joseph in, in Genesis 37. Now, because of this unique and special relationship that Jacob had with Joseph, Joseph's 11 older brothers hated him. It really caused problems in the family. So Genesis 37 verse 4, we read this, But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. And it says they could not speak peaceably to him. And, and, and it's obvious why that would be. Here's, here's daddy's favorite. 
and he even makes Joseph the coat of many colors. Again, sets him apart as a unique and special child in the family. So the brothers can't stand him. They hate him. And, and, and there's an amazing parallel here because Jesus had half brothers. The, the gospel narratives tell us this. And we know they didn't like Jesus either. So his own brothers hated him, same way Joseph's brothers did. You, you just can only imagine that Jesus being the Son of God was set apart and different from his regular, normal brothers, you know, like I would have been if I was in that family, born to Mary and Joseph. But Jesus is born from the Holy Spirit, so he's perfect, he's sinless, he's set apart, right? And so his brothers don't like him. His brothers don't believe he's a God-man. His brothers don't believe he's divine. At one point in the Gospels, they arrive to try to take Jesus home because they think he's crazy and he's embarrassing the family. Jesus dies on the cross. None of his brothers are present. They're not even there when he's executed. And so, just like Joseph, Jesus' brothers hate him, but it doesn't just stop at his brothers. Once his ministry really gets rolling, his whole community hates him. All of Nazareth uh, doesn't like Jesus and, 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 and sees him that way. So again, another parallel with Joseph. So what do the brothers do? They decide that they're going to get rid of this problem that they see in Joseph, their brother. So at one point, uh, Jacob sends Joseph to go check on his brothers. They're out uh, away from home working. They're shepherds. He goes to check on them, uh, and, and they see him coming, and they decide, let's just kill him. Let's just kill him. But Reuben's the oldest. He said, no, we, we don't need to kill him. We don't want you know his blood on our hands. So uh, one of them has a, a brilliant idea. They don't kill him. They just throw him down in a pit, a dry pit, a dry well. And Judah has an idea. Judah sees some Ishmaelites coming. He says, hey, let's just get him out of our lives. Let's just sell him as a slave to these passing Ishmaelites, and we'll get rid of Joseph. So that's what they did. It was Judah's idea. Now watch this. Judah sells Joseph into captivity for 20 pieces of silver. Now, I had never learned this until this morning, but in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, Judah is translated into the Greek Judas. You feeling that? So Judah, the Greek name would be Judas, sells his brother Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. And what happens to um, Jesus? Judas betrays and sells out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I bet some of you, most of you, had never seen that parallel in the Scriptures. I know that I had not. But we see Jesus showing up over and over and over in the life of Joseph. So he is sold into slavery. Um, he, he's taken all the way to Egypt by the Ishmaelites, and then a man named Potiphar buys him from their hands. So now he is a slave in the house of this Egyptian uh, ruler named Potiphar. Potiphar is a wealthy man. Before you know it, Joseph has uh, control over Potiphar's house, over his business dealings. He is taking care of all of Potiphar's um, you know, material wealth and goods. Uh, he's got... Uh, He's ruling over everything except for Potiphar's wife. But Potiphar's wife finds Joseph to be attractive, and she begins to seduce him to get Joseph to have intimate relationship with her. But Joseph is a man of God. And so Joseph flees from that moment. That embarrasses Potiphar's wife. And Joseph takes off running from the presence of her seduction. She grabs a hold of his coat. He flees. She's holding the coat. She hatches a plan. She decides to falsely accuse Joseph to her husband, who's a powerful man, when he gets home, accuse him of attempting to rape her. Here's what the scripture says, Genesis 39, verse 17. Then she spoke to him, to Potiphar, with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that his garment, uh, he 
that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard these words, which the wife had spoken to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused against Joseph. So Joseph is falsely accused. He's He's innocent, but he's falsely accused of attempting to rape this very powerful woman. In the same way, Jesus is falsely accused by these fake witnesses in the trial uh, in Jerusalem. And he's, he's, he's indicted uh, for blasphemy, for crimes against the temple. Let me, let me give you some scripture for what happened to Jesus, just like Joseph. Mark 14, verse 55 says, Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. Nobody would testify, no, no good witnesses. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies didn't agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him and said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I'll build another temple made without hands. But even then, their testimonies didn't agree. So here's Jesus in this mock trial, and he's being falsely accused by these so-called witnesses whose testimonies don't agree. Both Joseph and Jesus are falsely accused. What happens to Joseph? Potiphar throws him into prison. False accusation becomes real imprisonment. Genesis 39, 20, Then Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. So Joseph is put into Pharaoh's prison in the same way that Jesus is taken into Roman custody. Their lives are like two trains running down a parallel track. This is an amazing picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. Mark 14, 63 says, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they, which is the Sanhedrin, the, the religious and political rulers of the Jews in Jesus' day, they all condemned him to be deserving of death. It's an amazing parallel between Joseph and Jesus. Both innocent men, both living the right life, both falsely accused, both convicted to imprisonment into being captive for what they never did. So let's move the story forward. Now Joseph is in Pharaoh's prison. And the word tells us in Genesis chapter 40 that Joseph is accompanied by two other criminals. Genesis 40, verse 2. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. Joseph is accompanied by two criminals. Watch this. Jesus hung on the cross with how many? Two criminals. Luke 23, verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they were crucified. Uh, th there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand, one on his left. Is that amazing? Have you ever thought about the fact that Joseph's in prison with two criminals? Jesus is hanging on the cross with two criminals. As the story moves forward, uh, I'm going to kind of move past this quickly because I want to come back to it and really end this teaching with what takes place in the prison. But let me just show you right away, right here, a, a resurrection type in this story. Because Joseph's in prison for an undetermined amount of time. Uh, I, I think if I remember correctly, I should have looked this up. I think it's like 13 years. But if I'm wrong about that, it was years. It was a period of many years. But then Joseph is released from prison. And when he is released from prison, watch this. He's not just set free. Okay, go, go live life on the, on the outside. No. Joseph is released from prison, and he's elevate, elevated all the way to the right hand of power in Egypt. Genesis 41, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
in as much as God has shown you all this, why, what is he talking about? Pharaoh has a dream. He's vexed by the dream. He's, he's, he's having difficulty with the dream. Joseph is the only one that can interpret the dream. Joseph tells him that the dream means there's a famine coming. You've got seven years to prepare for the famine. Get your house in order. Uh, collect all the food that you can because it's going to get bad for seven years. There's going to be famine on the land. That's what Joseph did. And Pharaoh was so pleased with that that he releases Joseph from prison. And then watch what happens. Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Watch, this is Pharaoh, the most powerful human on the face of the earth at that time. He is a pagan, God-worshipping, not Jehovah, but, but, a, but a, a, a polytheistic uh, heathen. He's not a Jew. He's not a Jehovah believer. But he says, to Joseph, you shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Joseph, Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Joseph goes from a prisoner released from prison on the same day he is elevated to the right hand of the power of the great empire over the face of the earth at that time, Pharaoh and Egypt. He goes from a condemned prisoner to the second most powerful man in charge of everything except for Pharaoh himself. Does that sound familiar to you? I hope you understand the gospel message enough to hear that Jesus in the same way was on the third day released from death, released from the grave, and he was elevated. He was exalted to the right hand of power. 1 Peter 3.21 says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into the heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. The life of Joseph and his elevation, his exaltation out of prison to become the right hand man of the ruler of rulers on planet earth at least. In the very same way, Jesus is released from the grave, released from death to be exalted to the right hand of God. So let me just give you some, some concluding thoughts about this story. Joseph, God sends Joseph ahead of his brothers into Egypt years beforehand because God's going to send this famine and God has already determined that he is going to take care of Abraham's descendants. We talked about it yesterday that Abraham and Isaac, because of what Abraham did, God would bless his descendants and they would be a nation and the world would be affected by Abraham's descendants. He's already said that. So so Jacob and his sons are not going to die from famine, from hunger in Canaan. God's not going to let that happen. So what did God do? God sent Joseph to Egypt ahead of the famine, ahead of his brothers. Joseph didn't know it yet. He didn't know that that, that elevation to the throne was going to take place. But he was going to prepare a way of rescue for God's people. In the face of this worldwide empire-wide famine. Joseph gave, now watch, Joseph gave bread to his family, and not just the family uh, that he loved, but all the people in the empire. Joseph was responsible for giving them bread, for giving them food. So here comes Jesus from glory to planet earth. And Jesus came ahead of our final judgment, our condemnation, to purchase our salvation and to provide a rescue for us. In the face of eternal death that I deserve because of the sins that I committed and that you had committed, Jesus became the bread of life. Not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles too. Thank you, Jesus. John Verse uh, chapter six, let me read you some verses here. This is beautiful. Most assuredly, this is Jesus talking. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Joseph was sent into Egypt to provide bread for the world of his day. Jesus was sent from heaven to planet earth to become the bread of life. For me, when I was dying in the famine of my sin, what an amazing parallel. What a life Joseph lived to show us our Jesus thousands of years before in the book of Genesis. Let me show you a couple other things. I just, this, this stuff just piled up on me, man. It's, it's, there's so much. It's so rich. Um, think about this. Joseph is, is, is the ruler. What he says goes. The only person he cannot command in Egypt is Pharaoh himself. And now his brothers are before him. For a while, they don't recognize him until Joseph reveals who he is to them. But I want you to think about this. Joseph could have held his brother's sins that they committed against him. They tried to to kill him. They threw him in the well. They sold him. They made his father believe he was dead for all of these years. They treated him horribly. And for the next many years, they just assumed he's dead and gone, I guess. Joseph had every right and had the power to hold their sins against them, to take their life. And not only could he have done it, they deserved it. Right? They deserved it. He had the power and the right to enact judgment, but instead he chose to forgive them. And that's a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. We deserve the condemnation for the sins that we've committed. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die a thousand times over for the choices we've made, for the things we've done, for the things we should have done and we chose not to do. Jesus had the power and the right to hold our sins against us, but instead he forgave us through his gracious act of dying on the cross resurrecting from the dead. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, so familiar. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Joseph's story ends Genesis chapter 50 with a pretty fantastic statement that I want to I want to I want to give you as we conclude Pharaoh finally dies and even though they have lived together in harmony and in peace for some time when Pharaoh dies Joseph's brothers again begin to fear that with Pharaoh out of the way Joseph is going to do what he should have done years ago and he's going to enact judgment upon them so they're fearful for their lives this breaks Joseph's heart and he comes to them with this statement that what his brothers meant for evil against him, you know, betraying him, selling him into captivity, that led to his imprisonment, all of that, what they meant for evil, God turned around and used for good, both for Joseph, for his family, and for the whole Egyptian empire of that day. The scripture is Genesis 50, verse 19. And Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. In the same way, what Judas did to Jesus, what the Sanhedrin did to Jesus, what Pilate did, did to Jesus, what the Roman soldiers on Mount Calvary, what the Roman soldier that bore the cat of nine tails, what they did to Jesus, they meant it for evil to convict him, to condemn him, to torture him until he died. They meant it for evil, his betrayal, his arrest, his false conviction, his execution. 
But God meant all of that for the good of all mankind. Here's a few verses, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. 1 John 2.2 2, He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the whole world. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Hebrews 10.10, By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What a beautiful parallel between Joseph and what God did through his life and Jesus and what God did through his life. All right, let me, let me conclude with, with the icing on top of the cake. Um, the whole point, or one of the driving points in the first two installments of this series was the third day resurrection concept that's found over and over and over, over 30 times on the third day is found in the Old Testament. So is there a third day resurrection in Joseph's story. I told you there is a, a great tie to the resurrection as Joseph is released from prison and elevated to the right hand of power. That's a picture of the resurrection and the exaltation of Christ. But that didn't happen with a third day concept. So is there a third day concept? And the answer is yes. And here's what I kind of glossed over earlier. I want to give it to you because this is amazing to me. There is a third day resurrection in Joseph's life story, and it kind of goes like this. Joseph is in prison, and I told you he's there with two criminals. One of them is the baker, and one of them is the butler. We, we read further into the scripture, and we know that the, the butler's job is that he is Pharaoh's cupbearer in the throne room. So he's right there with Pharaoh in the throne room, in his presence, working hand to hand with him. So now both of them are in prison with Joseph specifically the cupbearer. Let's talk about him. The cupbearer has a dream one night, and it troubles him. He's, he's burdened with it. He, it's difficult for him, and he doesn't understand what it's about. Joseph sees that he's downcast. Joseph sees that he's, he's bothered. Ask him about it. He says, I got this dream. Joseph said, hey, God interprets dreams. Tell me what it is. So the cupbearer tells him the dream. Joseph interprets the dream. And here's what Joseph tells him. The three branches in your dreams is three days. The third branch blooms. That means that on the third day, you're going to be released from prison. You're going to be restored to your place before the king in his kingdom, in his throne room. And what happened? Three days after the interpretation, the cupbearer is released from prison and is restored back to the presence of the king to serve the king in the throne room of the king. So there's a third day resurrection story, but it's even better than that because Joseph interprets the dream and there's still three days, right? Three days before uh, the, the, the release from prison is supposed to take place. Joseph interprets the dream and here's what he says to the cupbearer. When you go back, to the king when you are restored back to the throne room remember me remember me i never saw this before it blew me away so the cupbearer in the third day theme is like jesus and remember, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and one of those criminals looks at him, and he says, when you return to your kingdom, remember me. Jesus says, don't you worry about it. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise in, in that kingdom. In the same way, there is a third day resurrection, and Joseph looks at the one that will be symbolically resurrected on the third day, and he says, when you go back to your position, when you're restored back to the king, Remember me. Guys, I don't know how you feel about it. That's amazing. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. 
the life of Joseph is just one moment after another, after another, after another, of not general and vague likenesses, but very specific ones. Tomorrow we're going to conclude this teaching, and I want to do it with something you probably aren't expecting. But we're going to look at Daniel. Daniel and Jesus. And we'll conclude this idea of the third day resurrection stories of Jesus in the Old Testament. I'll see you tomorrow.